Previously on The Month of Monsters. Average toy reviewer host Soundout12 becomes afflicted with the curse of a vampire, becomes bitten and transformed into a monster's werewolf, <coughs> becomes afflicted with the insanity of the Invisible Man, becomes theatrical due to the Phantom of the Opera. The truth behind why he was a mummy will shock you greatly. And how does he escape being a Frankenstein's monster? If you're not caught up with the story, catch up now and then return for Revenge of the Month of Monsters, beginning right now. Hello, this is Santa out here, and welcome to Revenge of the Month of Monsters, this year's Halloween special. We decided this year, as opposed to doing an entire month of videos once again, that we were going to just put some spooky decorations up, kind of casually do this, and follow up with the Month of Monsters. For those that may have missed it, in October of 2022, I did 31 daily videos for October featuring monsters and different kind of creatures and different toys and action figures and cereal and Blu-rays. And it was a really great time, except for the fact that I got cursed through the entire thing. I was stuck as a vampire. I got turned into a werewolf. I went insane and covered myself in bandages. Then I came back as a Frankenstein monster before being restored at the end. And if you haven't seen the entire saga, we have a compilation up on the channel in addition to the individual videos. I say all this because if you're watching this, you've either seen it or you're finding out about this for the first time because overall Month of Monsters was not a high success for the channel. That being said, my love for classic monsters does continue regardless of viewership, and that's why we're here today. So if you want to make sure this video succeeds, I'd appreciate if you do all the YouTube things, like button, subscribe, notification bell, comments, all that good stuff, and check out Month of Monsters if you haven't. It's some of my finest work in my personal opinion. And so because of that, Revenge of the Month of Monsters is simply a nice one video special covering follow-ups to everything we covered last year. So for example, you may see some extra spooky surprises, but for the most part, we've got some more NECA Universal Monsters. We got some more Ninja Turtles Universal crossovers. There's some more Jada Toys Monsters. There is a couple little uh, surprises thrown in and even a new serial test, which I'm sure my stomach isn't gonna appreciate. But all that will begin on Revenge of the Month of Monsters. We begin our special with, of course, some introductions of some hosts. How else do we begin but by introducing? So who do we have on the docket today? Let's find out. Now, during last year's Month of Monsters, we took a look at Elvira in the 8-inch Retro Cloth line, as well as Elvira in the Toonie Terrors line. But of course, we have a new figure of the Mistress of the Dark, and that is this brand new Toonie Terrors Elvira, who comes with the couch, as well as her dog, coming in a deluxe packaging here. What's really fun is the uh, little details on the back. A lot of these are references to the movie uh, Elvira Mistress of the Dark, which is great. And I think that overall, I'm really excited to take a closer look at this new figure of Elvira. So while this figure is essentially a statue, we do get this nice figure of Gonk, the dog. This is the dog post-Elvira transformation. She dolled this dog up. Look at him. Look at this dog. It's just, it's a beautiful looking figure. <laughs> it's just the pinks, the blacks, the uh, uneven fur on either side. Like this is the most punk rock goth dog you'll ever see. And I'm glad that it's in, in plastic form. I mean, it's just perfect. Uh, look at Elvira herself. She is, uh, of course, very nice. Her arms are articulated, so you can get her to do that, which just looks a little weird. Um, her head moves a little bit, and her other arm could move, but it's just all blocked up, so I don't even know why they bothered putting a joint in there. And then, of course, we got the couch, which is nicely detailed as well, which I think is really, really nice. And then you can put her right on the couch. So this is an iconic thing for Elvira. It's an iconic pose for her to be laying on the couch like this. And I think it's terrific that they took the opportunity not only to make this, but to add the dog. You can have the dog sit on the couch with her, which is really, really cool. So it makes a nice display piece, but it is very specifically just this one exact pose, which is kind of like how a lot of Toonie Terrors go. So it's just in line with the, the line itself. Behold, the master of mayhem himself, Vincent Price. 
I love how Vincent Price is such an icon of horror that you don't even need him as a character, you just need Vincent Price as an action figure. Super 7 was the first ones to jump on this. In a retro card styling that's very similar to their reaction Universal Monsters and other horror icons, they put out a nice figure of Vincent Price. Comes a little raven perched on his shoulder there, which is really nice. Got Master of Mayhem action figure. He is in a little bubble that holds him in place. Some of the other reactions I've gotten just kind of rattle loose around, so it's kind of nice to see the bubble effect there. But it is, of course, a Kenner-style action figure. Five points of articulation, all that good stuff. And on the back, you can see Master of Mayhem, a mild-mannered man turned horror, horror icon. Yeah, it's officially licensed by the Vincent Pr uh, Price uh, State. It's a very nice looking figure of this classic icon in horror history. The Gilman of the Black Lagoon, known as the creature from the Black Lagoon, is one of the most iconic monsters of all time. How has things changed since last year? Do we in fact have a new Gilman, now in two different flavors? The creature from the Black Lagoon, now presented in a 7-inch NECA Ultimate Edition figure. Been really excited about this one, kind of been looking to see what NECA will do with the paint scheme and the coloring, and boom! There he is, he looks really beautiful. Uh, there is, of course, a black and white version that does exist for this, but I am collecting the color line. And then here's everybody we can thank for this wonderful figure. Oh, he's everything I wanted him to be and more. Look at this guy. So he has the nice kind of moss-like green as opposed to like the bright green that we see with a lot of creature figures. And I think it just looks really great. He's got the iconic look to him here, but there is other head sculpts, so you don't just have to have the standard neutral. The paint detail is just incredible. Like pretty much what I would expect from NECA. It's just insane paint detail all the way down to the fingertips. Just looks really, really, really cool. Just the different tones between the hands and the, the fin parts. And just really incredible paint detail work that it just looks amazing. Sculpt and paint, top-notch stuff. Now what's also interesting is in order to accommodate his articulation, he actually has some rubber overlays where it's like he's kind of squishy in a good way because it kind of feels like what the creature would feel like. There is, of course, hard joints in the elbows and knees and the wrists, so that way you get those pivots. And the way they're designed is that they don't actually crunch down on the rubber parts too much. The rubber parts get out of the way. So you can actually get a good range of movement from that elbow without actually damaging anything in the figure. And he actually still has kind of a bicep swivel. It's just hidden up in the arm underneath the, uh, the coating, which is really, really cool. I will say the head range is a little bit limited. As you can see, it's a little bit limited there, and it's kind of hard to swap heads because of the spikiness of it. But he can crunch forward, crunch back. His hips move out. They are on those new NECA ball-jointed hips that I much prefer to their old hip style. He's got a bit of a thigh swivel, but not much. Then he's got a knee joint. It's got two. So he's got two double joint. So he's got double joint knees, and they go pretty far. And then also down here on the ankle, they move forward, back, left, right. He feels pretty sturdy, pretty solid, and looks pretty spectacular. Now, just like with pretty much all the figures, I like the articulation system a little bit more on the Jada toys, particularly with the fact he's got like working double jointed elbows and you can just kind of pose and bend this guy around. That's really fun. This guy feels more movie accurate in both his mobility and his detail, and I think that's what he exists for. So you got, you know, Jada for your posability, NECA for your movie accuracy. The Jada one came with a harpoon gun and net, so it's a little bit more exciting than the NECA one who just comes with heads and hands. But let's look at those heads and hands. His default head is this neutral expression. He also includes this partially open mouth head. And then he comes with this fully open mouth head, which actually is articulated so you can move the jaw. So if you want the cleaner look, you have the other two heads. But if you want to just have one that's a little more poseable, you totally got that option there, which is really, really fun. So the main hands are these flat but slightly curled hands. He also includes these hands that are very, very flat. Then a different version of the slightly curled fingers. And then my favorite of the hands, these really curled, ready to grab somebody hands. NECA absolutely nailed it with this figure of the Gilman. There has been so many Gilman figures over the years, and in terms of film accuracy, I think nothing beats this. This is really spot on, especially for an articulated action figure. I'm really, really impressed, and it's just a great, great figure overall. Appearing on a retro recreation of the Remco toy line, the retro creature from the Black Lagoon was released as a San Diego Comic-Con 2023 exclusive. We have a very nice, bright-looking figure without the glow-in-the-dark effect, but the figure is cast entirely in glow-in-the-dark plastic. Of course, to demonstrate this feature, we have to remove the light. 
And what a beautiful glow that is. It's a very good glow in the dark feature. <laughs> Come. Get ready. Fight. <laughs> The first part of our story today begins properly with the world of the vampires. While things, of course, took a turn last time, I made sure not to get bit. So hopefully nothing comes over me this year. But we do have plenty of vampire stuff to go over, and a lot of it is very Dracula-focused, in fact. So let's take a look at the Dracula that has evolved since we last looked at him. In case the prior Jada Toys Dracula wasn't up to snuff for you, the Lugosi edition is probably your jam. For me personally, I definitely did enjoy the original, but anytime you can get a Bell Lugosi edition Dracula, you should go for it. Uh, very nice presented in his white tux look, which gives him a little bit more distinction from the medallion look of the previous one. It is a completely new figure inside, and you can see as well, they've got Bell Lugosi as Dracula with some of the stage things that he was doing at the time. It's not so much supposed to be Bell Lugosi from 1931's Dracula, but Bela Lugosi as Dracula in public appearances. What's cool too is that he does have a separate tray for accessories. When pulling it out here, you can see that we've got extra hands, he's got a cape, he's got posters promoting that in-person Bela Lugosi as Dracula, as well as an extra more angry head. This is such a nice, fabulous presentation of this uh, box of a figure. That I really don't want to take it out, so just to appreciate that we've got Bela Lugosi in here as Dracula, because that is essentially how I'm keeping it. It's such a wonderful presentation, and it just shows the quality that uh, Jada Toys goes to, including some additional stills of Bella as Dracula there, and of course your legal stuff on the back. It's something I wanted to highlight, but it's not something I want to remove, because I feel like it's so perfectly presented in this nice-looking uh, package right here. NECA brings to us the ultimate Bela Lugosi, Count Dracula. Very nice box as always with the poster art as well as the fact that you can open it up and see the figure within. He is packed to the teeth with accessories and here is all the people who made this happen. And here is the Count himself, Mr. Dracula. What's really cool about this figure is that it's captured the look, it's captured the likeness, and it looks like it fits in the same style as the other NECA Ultimate Universal Monsters. This suit kind of sculpted design we'll see with a couple other figures in this video. So it's really nice to see. I also just really like the general shape of it. The other cool part is that the cape is removable, but attaching the cape isn't difficult. It's on a bit of a C-clip, kind of like the old uh, Batman and Robin capes from the Kenner lines, and it just goes right over, and it's large enough to drape over his shoulders in a very, very menacing fashion, which I think is terrific. But then because of the way it's cut, you can drape it back over his shoulders to reveal Dracula within and not lose the effect at all. This is one of the best cloth capes I've seen on action figures all year, and it's something that uh, Batman figures should take note of because that is the kind of look I like to see is where you can have that, but then also, you know, curl it back, flip it under the shoulders so that way it's also out of the way if you want to see the full figure underneath. Now this neutral head is quite striking and gives him a very, very devilish look. But if you want a bit of an angrier Count Dracula, this expression definitely does the job. Then there is the iconic stare to transfix you in his gaze. I love the different expressions for this Dracula figure and I also love that they're all on necks instead of being on heads. Because he has such a high collar, swapping a head would be tricky, so they just have you swap the entire neck, which I think is actually a really smart idea in order to make it a lot simpler to switch the heads around. But of course, that's not all he comes with. He has two hands and classic gestures in both. You also get a gesturing left hand, which has that iconic look, and then a more relaxed slash posed hand for the right hand, which has a variety of uses. He also comes with a hand to hold the candle to beckon you down the hallway. In addition to a serving tray with cups to drink, do you dare? Now Dracula's final accessory allows him to transform from a man into a bat. Perched high atop this very large stand, you can see we do have the bat form of Dracula, which looks really, really cool. At risk of repeating myself much further, the Jada, good for articulation and style, the NECA, good for movie accuracy. Now in case that wasn't enough accessories for you, let me present a box. The Dracula accessory set basically contains a box, the coffin, as well as some animal buddies. Also really nice artwork on the top, really nice uh, work by everybody here for what was done on the Dracula 
accessory set. Within the catacombs of Castle Dracula, Dracula's Lair. What's really cool, we got a nice backdrop of the castle setup. Though I will say there is a coffin in the picture. It looks like Dracula's coffin. So is that a weird glitch or is that just supposed to be another coffin? Uh, he also comes with uh, some animal buddies. Crawl around. You've got an armadillo. We've got, uh, it looks like a chinchilla or a possum. A big ass spider. And then what looks to be a tiny firefly-like bug out of its own coffin. Very strange. Kind of goofy. Kind of dig it. Really like it. And then of course we got this box. There is latches for carrying on either side on the bottom. Nothing much. But inside, Dracula! Kind of wish it did come with an extra head where his eyes were closed. Because it's kind of like you open it up and it's just like, boom! He's sleeping with his eyes open. Uh, he probably should, but you know. Still, it's just a thing I'm, I'm noticing. Overall, it just adds to the overall great experience with the NECA Dracula and his accessory set. Who do you call when you need a vampire hunted? No, don't say the Ghostbusters. You need a vampire hunter. Now, while NECA hasn't made any traditional Van Helsings, they have made Splinter as Van Helsing. And this is just continuing the wonderful Ninja Turtles Universal Monsters collaboration from NECA. Very nice paint artwork here. Splinter as Van Helsing implies a lot to me. First of all, that they're making a Dracula. And second of all, that Dracula's probably Shredder. I mean, they both have capes and uh, they're both rivals to their opposite characters here, Van Helsing and Splinter. So it just makes sense to me, but we'll have to see what comes of it. But we must remember, Splinter as Van Helsing. Trouble with monsters? Call the rat with the hat. Marvel at the razor sharp rodent. Cunning with a crossbow. He has tools for taming terror. Master of Ninjutsu, Hunter of Vampires, Slayer of Shredder. No, seriously though, like, Shredder's gotta be Dracula, right? Now, we'll admit, this is my first time experiencing any version of movie Splinter, so it was kind of shocking to me how weird these legs are. Like, they're very strange, they don't articulate that well. There is no left and right, so you kind of always have to have it under him, and the tail basically is doing all the work. Kind of a strange figure, but I love design-wise the way he looks here. The hat, the glasses, uh, the glasses are lensed. You can barely see it because the hat brim is so deep. You can probably see it on the unhatted head here, where you can see that, yeah, he's got the Splinter look to him. It basically is 1990 movie Splinter, but as Van Helsing. Very nice coat design, double joint elbows, claws. He's got places to store all of his weapons, which is really, really cool. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Now, he does have a little stand he comes with, which is supposed to help with stability on his feet, like this, I think, so you can have, like, his feet haunched up a little bit, like he would, you know, rat feet and such. So if you do that, and you have, instead of his feet flat, you have him hutch like this, uh, you just peg it in twice here, like that, kind of line it up, and then he becomes more unstable than if he was just flat, because the legs are very, very strange. He's also, like, always standing at an angle, so what I typically tend to do is just flatten his feet out and say, screw it, he's, he's just gonna have flatter feet, and that's gonna be fine enough. But let's look at those weapons. So naturally he does come with wooden stakes, but he doesn't come with a hammer, so I can assume he's gonna be like Blade, and he can just like stab it into a vampire, no problem. He also comes with a knife, which I assume is good for fighting anything that's not a vampire. And he does come with a single-handed crossbow here, which is a good callback to not only Splinter being an archer in many continuities, sometimes having a crossbow, but also some versions of Van Helsing having the crossbow as well. He does come with several arrows, and they are all stakes, which is really cool. He is out for vampires. And then he's got that knife just in case. Now, the unfortunate part about these arrows is that I've already lost one of them because having this guy on the shelf, if he tips over in any way, these just all spill right out because it's already at an angle to begin with. And there's a peg to keep it in place at that angle. And I kind of wish it did, it had a little bit higher of an angle on it because it's really easy to lose these. And I'm pretty sure I lost one because there's a slot in the tray that I wasn't able to match up with what was hanging on him. So I think when he fell over one time, which is easy to do because of the leg thing, he's probably my least favorite overall as a figure of the Ninja Turtle crossovers, but he is still a fun uh, addition to the collection and will be even better when we eventually get that Shredder Dracula that I'm convinced is happening. Let's take a brief snack break on our normal proceedings, as the monster cereals have returned for another year with Count Dracula, Frankenberry, and Boo Berry. This year they are joined by Carmella Creeper, a brand new monster, caramel apple favored cereal, and she is the long lost cousin to Frankenberry, which I think is pretty cool, and there's a little comic on the back 
that'll let you pause and read if you like. Uh, this is a brand new monster cereal. Uh, the first time there's been a new one since Yummy Mummy, way, way, way back when. There also is an updated monster mash that mixes all six together, which is kind of exciting. So we're gonna have to try both of these because, you know, I didn't learn my lesson last year when I ate too much of the cereal and uh, got a little bit of a stomach ache, but it's only two this time. We, we've done those, we taste tested those on, on screen. We don't need to do those again. We're just gonna go straight for the brand new, the Carmella Creeper, see what happens, that sort of thing. Um, it's always kind of interesting doing food stuff on the channel because I don't usually do that. Uh, I'm not usually a food guy. I like food. I like food a lot. Uh, I just don't usually review food because I feel like I have no set precedence for like how food is made. This smells delicious. I can smell it from here. Um, so we'll see how it goes. We gotta have milk, of course, because you know, it's, it's monster cereal. You gotta have the milk with the cereal. Also dry cereal just sucks. You know, I, that's just a personal thing. Okay, let's, let's try some Carmella Creeper. Wow, that's a pretty good flavor mix. It doesn't feel, it doesn't taste as sweet as some of the others. Because last year my problem was that they tasted way too sweet and I was just like, that's like too much sugar, but this has got kind of a nice balance to it. Yeah, I feel like I could eat that more so than the others because it's not as strong with the caramel apple flavor, but it's definitely there. And like the scent of caramel apple is really, really interesting. So it's actually, I like this a lot. Yeah, it definitely feels in line with like the others, but it kind of feels a little bit less intense, which is kind of cool. All right, so that was pretty good. Let's uh, test out the Monster Mash because, well, the last time I had the Monster Mash, it was a little uh, chaotic because it was a lot. So I'm gonna try to get a mix of everybody here without too many. I don't wanna eat this much. All right, so we got a good mix of like all the flavors because they put, it's basically blueberry and Carmella uh, cereal and then everybody else's marshmallows because if you start mixing in like the chocolate cereal, it's just gonna get like too chaotic or whatever. So let's uh, let's give this monster mash a go because uh, it is throwing like six cereals into one box, but it's selective. It's not like you could just make it on your own. Uh, you know, it's it's selective about what it puts in, which I think is interesting, but here we go. That's a little too many flavors at once. Where the caramel is less intense, the blueberry is like dominating. That's a lot. Uh, even though this is like supposedly only 11 grams of sugar for one cup, which is like less than Honey Nut Cheerios, but it still feels more intense because of the marshmallow part. So that one I don't like as much. I think the winner this year is the Carmella Creeper. And in fact, I think it's just really cool. We have a new monster. It also adds one more to the list of figures I want Jada Toys to make. But speaking of figures by Jada Toys, let's take a look at their brand new Booberry action figure. Released as a San Diego Comic-Con exclusive, and then later to several online retailers, uh, the Booberry figure from Jada Toys was much anticipated. Now, while it doesn't seem like they're continuing the line much further than this, I am very happy to at least have Booberry to finish out the iconic trio that come back again and again. Though, I would not be opposed to a Fruit Brew, a Yummy Mummy, and a Carmella Creeper. He's in a similar style box to the previous monsters where you've got that kind of faux backing that looks very similar to the original ones. He's got a window packaging to him here, so you can see him inside, and he looks terrific. I think he's a great looking figure and I can't wait to open him up, but there is a secret bonus feature with the packaging. For once you remove the lights, the glow-in-the-dark feature begins. On the front of the packaging, no less. What a cool thing for such a ghostly figure. And you can also see the interior glows, too. So here we have Boo Berry, looking super spectacular. What I love about him is that he is the nice blue color, looking very, very cool. He's got this little stand with a little shadow beneath him. You've got articulating arms, you got the head. He doesn't come with an alternate expression like the, uh, the previous figures did. It does seem like he is cast in a semi-translucent plastic as well. And then of course we got his cereal box here, which has Booberry on the front and a cutout mask design on the back. So it makes for a very nice figure. But of course, just like his packaging, he does have a secret glow effect. For when we remove the light, the glow appears. 
Looking very nice with not only the cereal box having a very, very bright glow to it on both sides, which is very, very impressive. Now, Booberry himself, his body glows a little bit lower than the head because of the blue coloring, but it's still really nice to see a glow effect on such a spooky ghost. And as you can imagine, he is a perfect pairing with Count Chocula and Frankenberry to make a nice cereal monsters display. While our vampire category was overwhelmingly Dracula, our werewolf category this year has some good variety. From the classic Wolfman, to an American werewolf in London, to a werewolf by night. There are several wolves stalking around. Be careful out there, everybody. So here we have the Toonie Terrors Scott Howard from Teen Wolf. This is essentially the main character who is a teenager who becomes a werewolf. It's one of those kind of weird movies where it's part comedy, part horror, part uh, the really horrifying thing is how teenagers acted in the 80s. It's really interesting to see a dynamic where the werewolf form is something that he tries to hide, but eventually it gets out in public and he tries to own it completely and it becomes his personality, which is also a problem besides just, you know, the, the bloodthirstiness of being a werewolf. What's really funny is, of course, the visual of a werewolf playing basketball, and this figure captures, I think, the style of the film really well, of course, including a basketball, He's in his jacket. It's not your typical werewolf story, which is, I think, what has made it such a uh, weird little pop culture moment that it was. It also is really funny because Michael J. Fox was Scott Howard. He played the character prior to filming Back to the Future, but this came out after, so tried to bank on it. And then he didn't return to the sequel because of the success of Back to the Future. That is the uh, Toonie Terrors Teen Wolf. One of my biggest sadnesses of Last Month of Monsters was that this set came out literally two days before the end of October, which means there was no way I could get it in in time to add it to a video. In American Werewolf in London, Toonie Terrors 2-pack. You get Jack Goodman, you get the Kessler Werewolf. Again, I love the little references on the packaging for these. Slaughtered lamb, balloons, all things you would know from the film itself. I also appreciate the fire. So here's the 2-pack. First of all, let's take a look at Jack, because Jack was uh, David's ill-fated friend who uh, ended up spending most of the movie as a zombie ghost. Uh, not the best uh, outcome overall. I think uh, David did get it worse with the werewolf bit, but uh, poor Jack was the living dead for most of it. And while this isn't completely detailed the way that the original makeup work was done, it's still a pretty gruesome graphic looking figure, but it's in that Toonie Terror style, so it's, it's less intense. Got the blood, the tears, the stains, the decaying face itself. It does look really good though. I mean, they just did a, a bang up job. I, I really am really starting to love Toonie Terrors a lot. He does have a ball jointed neck, rotating shoulders, wrist swivels, and nothing in the waist or legs. That means he's super stable, which is just really, really cool. And then to go alongside him, of course, we do have that classic werewolf design. And it's downright adorable here. I mean, look at him. He's, he's got kind of like a sweet look to him. I mean, he's still kind of terrifying. It's just a, a really terrifying design with the way those fangs are done and those haunting eyes. It's just really nice, and it's just a really nice uh, figure of it. And then you've got uh, these legs move, and then you can rotate the head a little bit. Too many terrors from here, mostly statues. I usually use the articulation just to adjust like the angle and the depth of of how things are moving but you know it's a good representation of the kessler werewolf in this style uh it's definitely not as horrifying as the ultimate kessler werewolf but that's that's to be expected the ultimate's more let's recreate the original prop as much as possible but you can see that uh size wise this guy's not a bad size uh comparing how large this figure was so it's really cool to see something else we haven't seen anything since this pack for American Werewolf in London, but if we do get more stuff, I'll be uh, happy to pick it up. The classic Universal Monsters Jada Toys Wolfman is presented in a new package. Him and the Invisible Man make up a second wave. We have not heard of a third, but I hope there will be because they still make some incredible figures. So as usual, the Jada Toys isn't as film accurate or as tall as the NECA figures, but what it does is it makes up for that with articulation. And what I love about these is how articulated they are. So first things first, he's got, of course, your full range of neck. He's got your full shoulders, your biceps, your double jointed elbows, your in and out pivots, your left and right wrists, your upper torso ball joint, your lower torso ball joint, hips that move out, hips that move forward, thigh swivel, double jointed knee. And then, of course, you've got an ankle swivel and then a forward and back ankle and a left and right. And also notice that they did go for, again, Skipping the accuracy, they did flat foot him, so that way he can pose a lot easier than the NECA figure with its more haunched feet. 
And with the included hands, you can pose this guy very easily into some very deep werewolf snarling kind of poses, which is really, really cool to see. No wonder this company got the Street Fighter license when they're doing stuff like this with Universal Monsters. He does come with a cane to hold and an extra set of hands for it, though it does make less sense for the werewolf to hold this than the actual uh, human form, which of course, you know, the NECA version can do. This is just werewolf form. And yeah, it's a little bit strange having him hold the cane unless you just want to have him beating somebody with it. He also does come with the bear trap that uh, the people hunting him hit him with. And having been hunted as a werewolf myself uh, last year, I can, I can relate to Larry here. I feel bad for him. But you, of course, can remove it, and it is articulated, which is really, really cool. Plus his little chain here. Uh, I like the actual fact that there's a metal chain on the bear trap accessory of all things. His default head is this sort of half snarling expression, a little bit calmer. But then of course you have this expression, which is the full rage mode. So Jada's Wolfman is fantastic and could make a nice lineup to your collection. And in fact, I do really like the flat feet because he's a lot easier to pose than his more movie accurate counterpart on the NECA side. Last minute addition to our werewolf section because Amazon had it on sale for 10 bucks the Halloween edition Wookiee for Star Wars The Black Series. I kind of wanted this guy when he first went up. He was originally a Walmart exclusive, and then I was like, I don't want to deal with Walmart. I decided to get him, though, when he was 10 bucks on Amazon. These holiday edition variants are always kind of fun. They do Christmas and Halloween ones, and they're just fun repaints. They're no in-universe thing, and I, I like them, but I never actually buy them. But, you know, it's a werewolf Wookiee, and look at how they packed it. Yeah, so the accessories, of course, are in your standard, like, white bags, but... They put it in Halloween tissue paper. And like, look at that. Instead of ghosts, we have little like Rota the Hut and the skulls match stuff from Star Wars and the spiders are those creepy spiders from the cave. And you know what? That tissue paper is super fun. It feels thematic to the holiday. So they kind of grayed out the colors in the Wookiee. They gave him the uh, comic book black Kersantan uh, bandolier vest, which I think works. And then they gave, they re-sculpted the head to give him werewolf ears. The Boglin's been uh, decked out for Halloween with uh, really creepy yellow eyes. But look at that, it's cute. Uh, what was Beskar, but is now painted to be chocolate bars. And then the actual Cantoon has been repainted to be a candy bucket. Pop it open. Uh, I think, what was it? The, um, the Werner Herzog figure came with this originally. But you can put the chocolate inside, close it up. Uh, you can give it to the Wookiee here. Okay, so there we got it. We got his little, you know, basically like McDonald's pale candy bucket, and then, then he's got his little creature with him. This is fun. It's not, you know, there is no lore implication for this. They didn't even write like a fake bio for it. They're like, it's a Wookiee as a werewolf. He comes with a little friend, and he's out trick-or-treating to get chocolate bars. Debuting in October of 2022, Werewolf by Night, the Marvel Studios special presentation, was a revolutionary storm for me because essentially I saw what I loved, uh, classic monster movies brought into the Marvel Universe and lovingly tributed in a wonderful black and white fashion. And then adding to that, they followed it up this year with a Werewolf by Night in color using color tones and palettes similar to the Hammer horror films. And both of those are great, though I do recommend watching the black and white Werewolf by Night first before watching the color one on a rewatch. It just really works out better that way. In general, though, I loved Werewolf by Night, and it is based on comic books from the Marvel Universe that I also quite enjoy. So, of course, I was looking this year to see if there'd be any Werewolf by Night merchandise, and the best thing we got was Funko Pop, because when all else fails, Funko is there to make merchandise off of basically anything. So, of course, we're going to begin with Elsa Bloodstone, as she is labeled uh, 1271. Can you believe there's that many Marvel Funkos out there? But Elsa Bloodstone is a terrific Marvel character from the comics and, of course, in the special. She is the heir to the Bloodstone family, a family of monster hunters, and she, of course, wants the Bloodstone for herself as, of course, the descendant. And her goal in the special is to get the Bloodstone, and she ends up helping uh, poor Jack Russell along the way. What's really cool about this Funko Pop is that we do have her with the little grab claw that she used to get the uh, Bloodstone itself, and of course they are presented in the black and white style as seen in the film. What's also interesting is you can see these streaks in her hair that are streaks of white, and in the color version they're actually streaks of orange to match her jacket, which is really, really cool. And a detail I didn't catch that she had those extra color streaks when I watched it in the original black and white, and that's why I think it's kind of worth watching both versions. Next up we have Jack Russell, who of course is the man afflicted by the werewolf curse. Uh, we never got confirmation how he was cursed to be a werewolf, but if we follow comics lore, he got it from his 
ancestors because it skipped a few generations and he got stuck with the werewolf curse. In fact, there is a line in the special alluding to the ancestors in regards to his face makeup. And so because of that, I feel like that is the story that has remained intact for the MCU. So it is a nice little figure of Jack Russell here, which is good to see because it does represent the character well. Now we have Jack's werewolf form, of course, the titular werewolf by night. Uh, what's really cool here is that he actually does have a stand because they did give him not flat feet, which is typical werewolf stuff. Because with, with the werewolf stuff, you want to have kind of your more bestial between man and beast sort of look. The face uh, makeup slash uh, tattoos there are matching to uh, Jack himself. In fact, uh, here's a side by side. But I think this is such a cool detail they added. He looks really good, uh, especially with the ears pointing out there. Now, because he does have those haunches, he does have a stand to keep him upright. So, of course, he's all good to go. Really nice figure of the werewolf. And then lastly, we have Ted, who comic fans would recognize as Man-Thing. And Ted is his name before he was the monster. He is an oversized pop, so he is a little bit larger. And he looks terrific. Uh, the one thing I don't like is the bobblehead, and that's not something that they could really uh, do anything about because it's like the legal thing. But you can see the split of where it was, and like the other Funkos where they, you know, you, could, you don't, you can't tell as much. It's like, man, I just want to kind of glue that in place so you can just be a nice big vinyl figure. He's got a really nice feel to him, very really solid and chunky, but the part that impressed me the most is the fact that the bloodstone is in his back, and much like in the black and white version of the special, the bloodstone is still that red color, uh, unlike the rest of the world around it, which I think is really cool. And I applaud Funko for adding that with some clear plastic and paint. I think in general, I'm just really happy to have figures from Werewolf by Night, even if they are just Funko Pops. Of course, I would love something like Marvel Legends to kind of tackle this, because I loved the specials so much, but it's a nice collection of Funko Pops at the very least. And one last little bit of Werewolf by Night merch is the Lego minifigure from the Lego Marvel Studios minifigure series 2. And I was very happy to get Werewolf by Night because this is the one I wanted the most. He does come with the Bloodstone as an accessory that he can hold with a little stand or a little handle, depending on how you wish. But as the figure himself, he's got really nice painted details all around to give him that werewolf-like quality. They gave him green pants which in the colorized version of the special, which was out after they, uh, they made this Lego figure, he does have black pants because he's wearing a black suit. Uh, this is green pants, is classic Werewolf by Night comic colors, so this kind of works as both. And then the other cool part too is he's got the hair piece, but you can have him snarling or you can have him smiling, which is just really funny because he doesn't really do that in the special. But I'm happy to have a little werewolf to put on my desk nonetheless. And look at him, he's a happy little boy. Last year's mummy had a lot to be seen. This year, it may just be a box in between. So our one mummy item is this NECA mummy accessory set, which as you can see is presented this very nice artwork on the package here. It contains two items, the sarcophagus and the box for the scroll. Uh, by the way, credits to the, uh, the packaging artists and the people that work on these as always. So there's actually three items in the box. You get the sarcophagus, you get the chest, and then you get this cool backdrop. And what's nice about this backdrop is it actually is pretty sturdy. It's a pretty thick cardboard. It does fold in two so it fits inside the box, but you can fold it out and place it behind the sarcophagus like this, which I think is really cool, especially with it being tall enough to kind of cover your sarcophagus area, which I think is pretty awesome. Uh, taking a look at the chest first. So of course the chest is for the scroll. You can pop the lid off the chest like this. I've already put this in here. So the box, the accessory set comes with just this, but this is what came with the mummy that had the scroll in it. So you can take that, put that inside the chest, lock it up in the chest, nice and safe. So that's, that's pretty cool. But of course the main attraction is this sarcophagus. Uh, it's just beautifully detailed, wonderfully done. As you can see, they've painted and sculpted every little detail you would expect. Uh, the paintwork is phenomenal on this thing. It's just really incredible. It's nothing on the back because you know it would be either laying down or standing up, uh, but there is just wonderful paint detail on either side. And then of course, when you open it up, oh, the mummy's inside. I've already added the mummy inside because I just had to. I mean, he's basically been in here ever since I got this. But there he is looking super cool inside. Of course, the interior is even detailed with the hieroglyphics running around the edge, which is just really incredible stuff. I typically display it uh, on the shelf, a little bit like this. A little foreboding, a little more mysterious. I don't think it's a necessity for every mummy collector, but if you really want the sarcophagus to go with the mummy, it's definitely worth the price of admission. Oh. 
Now let's not get too crazy here. The Invisible Man has plenty to display. In fact, I wish that all these were out last year. We could have done a little bit more with it. However, we have a lot of Invisible Man to catch up to, which is impressive considering they're hard to catch due to being invisible. But we have three different Invisible Men on display, and let's see what they have in common. But what makes them different? While we cannot see what they truly are. So Jada Toys managed to get their Invisible Man out before NECA. And he comes in the standard box here that you saw with the Wolfman, where they haven't really updated the portraits at all. So here is the Invisible Man, looking very visible. They went with the bathrobe look, which was really cool because NECA did go with the business suit look. Of course, this is after he's become invisible. He wants to make himself visible and also so he can have an actor perform the character. They've got kind of the different, you know, elements to keep his body visible, which I think is really, really cool. Uh, what's also really cool is the detail done on the pants to make them look like, you know, pajama pants. I really do think they did a terrific job with this. I was a bit worried he'd be a bit of a traffic cone, but as you can probably already see, this is all a soft material. It's not a fragile feeling material, but it's a soft material, which means he can pose however you wish. And considering the uh, Jada Universal Monsters line is essentially like a test bed for other figures in a lot of ways, um, you can have your Invisible Man, even with his crazy skirt, he can do a, a Kamen Rider kick. So that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> just, I love that these things are stupidly articulated. But yeah, so he's got all the, the same range of movement that the Wolfman did, but of course he's wearing a, a big old bathrobe. So that's just crazy. The other cool part about him is his accessory loadout is fantastic. He of course comes with his trademark hat. He comes with the invisible formula and a hand to hold it, as well as his book of notes on how to make said formula. And of course, when he's ready to turn invisible himself, he tears the bandages off his head. This is a pretty convincing effect. I like that the uh, actual hand connects to the head this way. It does sort of get interrupted by the black uh, spot there when you're in this kind of lighting. But if you're in a normal lighting situation, you can't even notice that and it just looks like a black void. I have saved the best for last, but the brilliance of this accessory is incredible. Having an alternate hand to have him removing the glove off the other hand is just really amazing. And you can play with this a lot, especially with the fact that the hand is totally removed. So there is nothing there, but it gives the illusion that something is. And I think that is some brilliant action figure work. This Invisible Man figure is way cooler than he ever needed to be, but I'm so happy with how he turned out. Just a terrific, terrific action figure in a very great line. This may be all for now from Jada Toys' the Universal Monsters line. They showed us a mummy at a convention, so I hope that still releases. That's kind of the last of the main monsters we haven't seen. But this line is terrific, and Jada Toys has upgraded themselves to really prominent licenses like Street Fighter and Mega Man, and I can't wait to see what they do with those. Behold, the fantastic sensation of the Invisible Man in the Ultimate Edition figure from NECA. Very, very interesting to see this guy compared to the Jada Toys version, but here is the wonderful people that brought it to life. The Invisible Man, visible once again, and I wanted to bring in for comparison the Jada Toys version, just so you can see that they went with the suit version here, and they went with the bathrobe version here, which I think is super cool. It's not necessarily an intended choice, but I appreciate it. This is him bandaged, a little bit post-craziness, so he's still got, you know, some hair sticking out here. Uh, more on that in a moment. The fake nose, the fake goggles. He's a bit of a kooky guy. If you've never seen the original Invisible Man, he definitely is a psychotic serial killer, but he's kind of funny. Um, but yeah, other than that, he's kind of just a standard suit body. You know, he is a suit... Uh, he's got yellow gloves, but what's really cool about him, much like the other one, is the accessories give him a lot more dimension and depth than just the base figure provides. For example, with a bit of a hand swap, we have the invisible formula that he can carry around. He also comes with this formula book with a couple set of hands to hold it. Plus, you get a set of hands that have the thicker gloves to them. As a reminder, his main head is fully covered up, including the fake nose. And the first alternate head is with the goggles and the fake nose removed. I will mention he does come with separate goggles. They fell off the back of the shelf. I have not been able to find them again. I don't know why they vanished, but they did. Uh, they must have turned invisible. But as you can see, it's a basically a hollow head in there, so it gives a really good illusion that you have nothing inside. And then the fake nose is also a separate piece, in case you wanted to hold that, and it's so tiny they gave you two spares just in case. Uh, really appreciated. And then this other head retains the fake nose, but has a more open face. Really cool way of using the negative space, but he does look a little bit like a Muppet uh, this way. But 
it is pretty cool. I do wish we got something sort of like this with the inset like neck joint on the Jada with the bandage, because I wish there was bandages for him to hold. That's, a, that's another thing I think is a little bit missing. But you do get his hair. Yeah, his fake hair, also an option, and he can hold it, which is cool. I mean, look at that. He's like holding his fake hair. Ain't that neat. And because this is action figures, you can see he has turned fully invisible. He is, is invisible. He's just removed his gloves and his bandages, and only the clothes remain. That's honestly super fun. It plays with the fact that swappable heads and hands are a standard on action figures now. Overall, this is a very fun figure of our favorite madman. Our next Universal Monsters Ninja Turtles crossover, Donatello's the Invisible Man, is making me realize Invisible Man Week was way better this year than last, except we're not doing a whole week. It's just a segment. But here is Donatello inside the box. Here he is on the outside. And then here, you'll never see him coming. Donatello as the Invisible Man. Watch out behind you. Madman or genius, you decide. Catch him if you can. Once the bandages are peeled, the mystery will be revealed. Look out, his secrets under wraps. And these are all the people involved with making the figure. The fourth Ninja Turtle that has been made in the line, Donatello, looks terrific. He has a different uh, Invisible Man approach. He's not standard suit body. He's got a trench coat jacket. Of course, he's got the turtle uh, knee pads and elbow pads. You can see that his feet are invisible and partially bandaged, which is really, really cool. And then my favorite part, which is the shell that is invisible, and you can see the floating pizza inside. That is really, really cool, even if logically it doesn't make much sense. I love the way they do these figures, especially love the way the goggles look. Everything about them is terrific. He does come with accessories. He has a stellar hat that makes him look really cool. He has his bow staff, which is kind of boring. They didn't really do anything to change it from a normal staff. It's got more wrapping, but come on, make it partially invisible or something. He comes with a pointing hand and an extended hand. He comes with the invisible formula and a hand specifically designed to hold it. He comes with his invisible formula notebook, which has the TGRI logo on it, a nice in-universe tie-in. He also comes with this really cool tiny microscope. But watch as the transition begins to an invisible form, as the invisible turtle makes his debut. I really love this, uh, the clear plastic feet, the clear plastic hands. You know, you don't have to use those, you could just remove the hands. I mean, it's hard to imitate invisible feet. But I just think it's a really cool thing and it kind of goes with the toyeticness of it in addition to the way the shell is done. What's really impressive is the head. Much like the regular Invisible Man, it is hollowed out inside, so you get that, oh, you can't see him, he's in there. But I like that Donatello kept the fake hair. Nice detail, Donnie. And of course, Invisible Donnie has to be with the monster that inspired him. The Invisible Man and Donatello make such a great pairing that I'm happy we got this figure. He's so cool, especially with all his accessories. And I can say that about all the Invisible Man figures. The opera is a place to celebrate, to tell a story, to weave a tale. But what hides inside the opera house is the thing that we'll focus on today. Hailing from the Lon Chaney version of the Phantom of the Opera, the ultimate Phantom. This is my favorite version of the Phantom of the Opera, and I'm so excited to have this figure and share it with all of you. I'm also very grateful to all the people that made this figure happen. Sometimes you gotta sit back and appreciate that a movie that's nearly 100 years old has a brand new action figure in the modern day. This is uh, my favorite of the Phantom of the Operas. Lon Chaney was just terrific in the part. And yeah, we don't get action figures based on silent movies that often, and here we are. But anyways, this is Lon Chaney's Phantom of the Opera. Very nice head sculpt. They got the, uh, you know, the hair that goes around and has the big old bald spot there. The, uh, the sunken in eyes, the nose, everything that he put into his makeup. And it's really cool. I really do like it. He's got... You know, the high-waisted pants, just the overall look is just fantastic. And he is just an excellent representation of the Phantom from that film. In addition to this more neutral expression, we have looking to the side and smiling. We have looking to the other side, concern. And we have the famous dramatic reveal, which just looks terrific. That's like my favorite head on the whole figure. <laughs> Plus, the Phantom can be disguised with this cloth robe that does have its own wire in it to pose, which is pretty interesting. But of course he does have that creepy face mask. So to remove the hat here, you can see he's got the face that is above his actual face, and they layered it with two layers of plastic here so you can actually see his teeth underneath. It is super creepy and weird, and I love it. In addition to these organ playing hands, you get a pointing hand for the right hand, and a pointing hand for the left hand. Plus you get another gesturing left hand and a holding hand for the right, 
which also includes his breathing stick, so he can go from his lair back to the main areas while walking underneath the water. NECA knocked it out of the park with this figure, and I am so happy to have my favorite version of the Phantom in a great ultimate figure. The New York Comic Con exclusive retro Phantom of the Opera is uh, getting us one step closer to completing the retro collection. What I love about this figure in particular is that they actually went and sculpted something new for him. All the others have been basically repaints, but they gave him the cheap vinyl uh, cape look that the original Remco toy had. Just the really flat, super high collared, not great, not realistic cape design. Love it. It just adds to this uh, whole figure and the whole experience, and they seem to have done the same exact thing for Dracula. Got two different flavors of Phantom, which is really, really fun. But of course, he does have a glow-in-the-dark feature. For when we remove the light, the Phantom glows bright. And quite bright, too. Really impressive. What a more perfect pairing than Casey Jones as the Phantom of the Opera. A terrific box art image here. Casey Jones joins the Universal Monsters line. Also, these are the lovely people that brought us this figure. The enigmatic and operatic man behind the mask. Bringing fear in hockey gear. Experience theatrical frights. The penalty box vigilante stalking under the stage. Who or what is it? Slashing beneath the ice, Casey Jones as the Phantom. What a perfect pairing we have. I love the way this looks. So they've mixed in the Phantom like tie and the suit jacket and the mask. It's very Phantom-esque. The long black hair of Casey Jones. And then he's got goalie gear. They really amped up the goalie stuff specifically uh, with the way the pants are done. They're kind of old school hockey goalie pants, which is really, really spectacular. It also has like tears and rips in the in the socks there which is fantastic he's got cleats it's kind of amazing actually he's got kind of the standard hockey gloves that you would expect which is uh, pretty cool but yeah i mean he's really neat something interesting is i thought this torso is going to be one solid piece but it's actually got a little bit of movement because it's all rubber through here so it's kind of a an interesting way to do the articulation on a casey jones but one that we hadn't seen like that otherwise. But of course, I think where this guy really shines, like a lot of these figures too, is the accessories. Now he does come with a similar cape to the Phantom. The Phantom's cape is got a little bit short, or a little bit wider of a neck and then a little bit different of a clasp, but it's the same kind of material. I find it to be a little large. You know, Casey Jones is very dramatic, but I don't think dramatic cape is very practical and he is very practical in a lot of the way he wears things. So yeah, it doesn't work for me entirely because it just kind of gets in the way a lot, but it does look cool in certain poses. So he comes with a ton of hands. Let's run them down, starting with the fists. And then you have the open grabby hands. Smaller grip hands for the smaller hockey stick. And then larger grip hands for the larger stick. But then we get a set of goalie gloves, including some spikes added to the end here and a painted skull and crossbones, which uh, gives me a little 2012 Casey Jones vibe. And the nice part is he can still hold his goalie stick in this hand if you so wish. So he's kind of more goalie inspired now, which is neat. Now, of course, while that mask stays intact, everything is fine. But once it's been broken away, the secret's revealed. And holy cow, what a gnarly head sculpt in there. That is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. It's just like it's broken away, just like the Phantom Mask. You can see all the scarring, the detail, and he's looking at you like, how dare you? And then if you want a little Mask of the Red Death in your life, an option exists as well. I must say, the Phantom of the Hockey Arena and the Phantom of the Opera make a nice pairing together. Two Phantoms, two different flavors, two different styles. It's all very cool. The Universal Monsters Ninja Turtles line did not need to go this hard, but NECA did and I love it. I love every single one of these. I think Splinter's my least favorite, Casey Jones is my favorite, so, you know, everybody else falls in between then. These are incredible. They could have just remade the old Playmates figures, but they went with something new, and I absolutely love it. My dear audience, we've come to our final segment. How else to end but with the start of the monster craze, Frankenstein. This year, not as heavy as last year. We had to do seven videos of Frankenstein last year. This segment, it's only a couple, but what we do get is very cool, very unique, 
and very special. Let's take a look and see what the Doctor was cooking in the last year. The Frankenstein of the DC Universe is an interesting character, being adapting many of the elements of the classic Frankenstein and his monster story, but giving him his own personality and life. He takes the name Frankenstein as an adoption of his father's name, essentially to honor the scientists that created him. And he works as an agent for the organization known as Shade. And that's what makes Frankenstein such a cool character in the DC Universe, is you see him and you're like, oh, that's Frankenstein's monster. But he's got a lot of things going on, and I really, really love the character. Surprisingly, until McFarlane Toys hit us up with a nice mega fig of the character late last year, we hadn't actually seen an action figure of Frankenstein prior. And I'm kind of glad that McFarlane did it, because he's got a very nice large size to him, as well as the extra sculpted detail, like the stitching in the arms in particular. He comes with one accessory, which is a sword that stores in his back, which is pretty nice. It would have been nice to include, like, some other weaponry, um, I know they can't make uh, gun weaponry, but that would have been something cool to see. It's got kind of your standard articulation for a mega fig, but he just looks terrific. Really nice, big, solid action figure of Frankenstein. On top of that, he comes with the standard base, even though it's basically pointless because he's got the big old feet. And he does come with a trading card featuring artwork. Uh, he is labeled as the Seven Soldiers of Victory version, but is pretty much the same design he's always had since that debut in the Seven Soldiers series. So it's nice to see some consistency with one of the characters in the DC Universe, considering how often people change. The Frankenstein accessory set has, again, beautiful artwork on its exterior packaging, and mostly contains the operating table that Frankenstein was born on, with a couple little accessories here and there. Of course, here's the uh, credits for the packaging and the design of the figure. So as we can see in Dr. Frankenstein's lab, one wall doesn't stay open. The backdrop is very nice. It's got the nice eerie ambiance of the lab. It's just that that wall tends to, to cave in a little bit. I've gone ahead and put the monster on the table, even though he's not included with the uh, accessory set, but he is strapped down in multiple places here, which is kind of intense and you can get him out of there. Uh, it just takes a lot of work. In fact, the table itself has to be assembled down to the little spinny things. Uh, nothing is pre-assembled on this. You gotta do some work to get your table together. But once you do, it looks really, really nice. You also do get this alternate head for Frankenstein's monster that is, of course, the bandaged head. And then you get the cloth to drape over him, which looks really nice. You can also add this plastic cloth just hanging from one of the strats. I don't like it that much because it kind of squeezes whatever it clips to, so I just kind of leave that one off. And then you get a uh, torch, which, you know, it, we don't have any angry villagers or, or mad scientists, so I guess we'll just have RoboCop do it. Um, I don't know. We need somebody. Yeah, RoboCop, uh, scare away the monster or something. Anyways, point is, cool table and nice backdrop. The most famous character to exist for five minutes on screen, the Bride of Frankenstein. Brought to us by these lovely people. This is a figure many of us were waiting on. So let's not wait any longer for the Bride of Frankenstein. Knocked it out of the park yet again, Bride of Frankenstein. First things first, let's talk about skin tone. I like her normal kind of regular uh, complexion here. It sometimes gets grayed out in a lot of color versions, but I like the way this looks. I like the scarring around her cheeks and around her neck. It is very prominent there, which is really, really cool. The shocked expression on her face, the uh, hair, the lines in the hair, that iconic look with that hairstyle. The fact it's not quite even, that's a great piece of detail as well. The fact that her uh, dress here is sewn together and they actually did it with string. Really, really impressive. Also a little terrifying because I don't want it to unravel. And you also notice that the material is long and flowing as it should be. It is a very, very large piece of fabric in the film and that is the case here. Now we have to lift this up because there is a fully sculpted body underneath with a full range of articulation as you'd expect for a NECA figure, which is so, so cool. She is just terrific looking. Now she looks good standing on a shelf. That's pretty much all she does. It's not like, I don't know, the, uh, the Kung Fu martial arts master uh, Jada Toys Bride of Frankenstein, who I also still love, but you know, this is a little bit more accurate than this, even though this is still a very, 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 very good figure. Better than she honestly should be. This figure needs to do one thing, like point and scream. And guess what? She can do that. First things first, she comes with these flat, open, stretched hands in comparison to her flat, calmly relaxed hands for two sets of hands in total. 
And there it is, the iconic scream heard throughout your neighborhood when you leave the sound up too high before her debut. She looks incredible. That's an incredible screaming head. The other interesting part too is that she actually changes out at the neck, not at the base of the head. And there's actually a reason for that. She comes with a third head. And that third head is for her fully bandaged appearance, which is nicely painted and sculpted underneath, even down to the staples across the bandages. And this head up here looks terrific, and that's the reason for the swapping neck, so that way you can replace this with a fully bandaged head. And even going a step further, there is a faceplate where you can see her eyes underneath. Really cool, I hope we do get a uh, standing table for her to be able to stand on. Like she can stand on the table, because the one that came with Frankenstein's accessory set will not work. You also do get a couple loose bandages, but uh, I'm more tempted to give these to Invisible Man than her. But yeah, I love the I love the look there, where you can just kind of pull the little uh, faceplate off of that. But yeah, that's really incredible that they uh, sculpted and made the whole figure compatible with her sort of mummified form as well. So naturally, the comparison you all wanted, Frankenstein's monster, Bride of Frankenstein. Looking fabulous together, even if she doesn't want to be with him. They look terrific, and scale-wise, they're pretty much perfect. So they hit it out of the park. Dress, bandages, screaming. You got the whole package for her very minimal screen time for such an iconic look of a character. I just absolutely love it, and it just is terrific to see the movie accurate version after waiting for her for a while. I think she really rounds out the collection nicely. NECA's ultimate figure line for the classic monsters is fantastic. While they've done the major ones, there's still more to come. They have so many in the pipeline. There's a Christopher Lee Dracula coming. There's Professor Burke from London After Midnight. There's a Nosferatu's Count Orlock. There is so much coming, and I'm so excited that this line is continuing to go because this is absolutely one of the best action figure lines of the entire year, of the last decade. I'm so impressed, and I want it to continue to be as good as it's been because it makes me very, very happy as a Monsters fan. And now we've come to the end of our Halloween special, our low-budget sequel to The Month of Monsters. Revenge of the Month of Monsters has concluded. I hope you all really enjoyed this. I had fun making it, and it was a blast to kind of revisit the concept. We, of course, aren't going to do another 31-day video streak next year, but maybe we'll do another Halloween special. But that is up to you, the audience, with the power of the like button and the subscribe button and the notification bell in the comments section. Because if this video does well, of course, I will want to follow it up. I want to follow it up anyways, but of course, YouTube things, you gotta, you gotta, it's gotta be successful to keep doing it. So let's see what turns out next year. The power is yours. But you can also check out several other things on this channel. In the meantime, our live stream is Mondays at 5 p.m. Eastern. Our Discord server in the link below. You can also find me on social media at SoundOut12. You can find my awesome graphic designer who did all the wonderful animations last year that we reused this year, DarkClaw643. You can find him on social media and on Discord. You can also find HeroClub at HeroClub.com for movie news and more. And until next time, this is SoundOut saying, Happy Halloween. All right, another Halloween down. No major hiccups, no major curses. Just uh nobody nobody noticed that werewolf bite. So that's good. That's good. Good thing that's not on record in any way. Don't want to get cursed again, do we? Oh, still recording. Yeah. <laughs>